Hello everyone. Today we're continuing our deep dive of Richard Dawkins and Yan Wong's book, The Ancestor's Tale. In this episode, we're going to discuss the evolutionary effects of polygyny. So let's jump right in. <laughs> We are still in the same super order as the last tale, but today we're switching from order Artiodactyla to order Carnivora. The name Carnivora means the meat eaters, but not all Carnivorans are carnivores, like the giant panda. Further, not all carnivorous animals are carnivorans, like crocodiles or the Tasmanian wolf. Carnivorans are diagnosed by having three incisors on the top and bottom jaws and no third molar. The fourth upper premolar and the first lower molars have been modified in carnivorans into teeth called carnassials, which are enlarged, self-sharpening teeth that move past each other in a shearing motion. This allows carnivorans to rip flesh off their prey, except for the giant panda who uses his carnassials for chewing bamboo. In fact, in bears generally, with the notable exception of the polar bear, the carnassials don't have such well-developed blades, being used more for chewing than slicing though the teeth can of course serve that function too. Carnassial-like teeth have independently evolved many times. The Tasmanian devil and wolf have, or had, modified carnassial-like molars. In fact, the dentition of the Tasmanian wolf is so similar to a dog's that an easier way to tell if a canid-looking skull is actually a Tasmanian wolf's is the two prominent holes in the palate bone. A few tales from now, Dawkins recounts a story of when he was a zoology student at Oxford. The students had to identify 100 zoological specimens, including skulls, and word eventually got around that if a supposed dog skull was on the test, then it was likely a Tasmanian wolf skull. The professors, catching wind of this, then bluffed the students, putting an actual dog skull on the test. As a botany teaching assistant myself, I can say I've borne witness to students putting answers on tests for plants we didn't have that year, but the year before. Anyway, other mammals that have evolved carnassial-like teeth include the oxyanodonts, hyanodonts, and arctocyanids we met last time, as well as marsupial boreanids, the carnivorous bat necromantis, and, strangely, pycnodont fish. All these groups are now extinct. As for the evolution of carnivora, stem carnivorans can trace their lineage all the way back to the early Paleocene. Remember that the clade Ferrae includes the extant orders Folidota, the pangolins, and carnivora. But as we saw last time, there are several extinct groups related to carnivora. One of the major stem lineages of carnivorans is the family Viveravidae, which first appeared at the start of the Paleocene. Viveravids were small, mongoose-like carnivores that first appeared in North America before spreading to Europe and Asia. Then Hyenodonta branches off next, followed by Oxyanodonta. One subfamily of Oxyanodonts called Machyridontinae independently evolved saber teeth. Remember that these two groups were the dominant predators before the more familiar carnivorans appeared. Another stem group of carnivorans is the paraphyletic family Myosidae, which existed from the early Paleocene to the latest Eocene or earliest Oligocene. Again, most of them were smaller, mongoose-like carnivores who first appeared in North America and spread to Europe and Asia. Representative of the paraphyletic nature of Myosidae, the genus Myosis is itself paraphyletic, having been used as a wastebasket taxon, and a number of species formerly assigned to it have been renamed, such as Dormalision from Belgium. From within Myosidae, crown carnivora emerged and split into two suborders, Filiformia, the cat-like carnivorans, and Caniformia, the dog-like carnivorans. The former suborder encompasses the false saber tooth family Nimravidae, Hyenas, cats, mongooses, meerkats, fusa, kivets, genets, and the binturong, and the latter contains the dogs, bears, seals, red panda, and weasels. An interesting 2018 paper lays out a hypothesis for why ungulates tend to be active during the day, or diurnal, and carnivorans tend to be active at night, or nocturnal. The paper begins by noting that various prey animals have shifted their deal activities to counter those of predators. For example, the Norway rat, Radus norvegicus, has been found to shift from nocturnality to diurnality 
under predation by nocturnal red foxes, which is Vulpes vulpes. Relevant to ungulates, the paper says, quote, Furthermore, ungulates, e.g. buffalo, kudu, and giraffe, in African savanna, were shown to be capable of avoiding the hours of the day with a high predation risk from lions, suggesting that predation pressure was the key to the switch in their activity patterns. In particular, ungulates, such as buffalo and kudu, that are more active at night in the absence of predators, became more active in the daytime after the reintroduction of large nocturnal predators, such as lions and hyenas. Close quote. This paper found that 68% of carnivorous mammals are nocturnal, but wondered what was the ancestral deal activity for carnivores, nocturnal or diurnal. Remember from the howler monkey's tale that mammals went through a nocturnal bottleneck while the non-avian dinosaurs dominated the earth. That bottleneck evidently occurred prior to the last common ancestor of all mammals, with subsequent transitions to trichromacy in different lineages. Evidently, genes involved in cone phototransduction, such as CNGB3, show positive selection in carnivorans, indicating that enhanced visual acuity under bright light conditions were strongly selected in early carnivorans. Conversely, genes for rod phototransduction, such as RH1 and PDE6B, were under strong selection in ancestral ungulates, suggesting nocturnal behavior. Thus, there is a shift in both carnivorans and ungulates to modern behaviors largely opposite from ancestral ones. The reason is likely that carnivorans switch to nocturnality to prey on ungulates, and the ungulates then switch to diurnality to avoid predators. There is, however, nothing stopping these groups from switching again. Carnivorans may switch to diurnality again to counter ungulate behavior, and the ungulates may switch again to nocturnality to counter the carnivorans, and round and round the cycle goes. Now we come to Pinnipedia, the seals, sea lions, and walruses. Pinnipeds mostly live in the cold waters of the northern and southern hemispheres, but some species live in much warmer areas, like the Californian sea lions. The name Pinnipedia means fin foot, since their walking legs have evolved into swimming fins. The earliest pinnipeds in the fossil record look more like weasels, and that makes sense. The closest extant relatives of pinnipeds are the mustiloids, weasels, otters, raccoons, skunks, and red pandas. Puigila was an otter-like mammal found in deposits on Devon Island dating to 24 to 21 million years old, which is late Oligocene to early Miocene. Side note, Devon Island is adjacent to Ellesmere Island, where Tiktaalik was discovered. Next, Potamotherium dates to 23 to 11 million years old and also looks like an otter. However, it is more aquatically adapted than Puigila. Finally, an Aliarctos dating to 24 to 22 million years ago looks much more like a sea lion, though it falls outside all the extant pinniped families. Thus, we come to the seal's tail. Typically in nature, dioecious species, which are those that have male and female reproductive organs in separate individuals, have approximately equal numbers of males and females. Exceptions occur in species that reproduce parthenogenetically, like deloid rotifers, whom we will meet in a future tale, and desert whiptail lizards that are all female. British statistician and evolutionary biologist Ronald Fisher was one of the first to explain why this is so. Should one sex become rarer than the other, the rarer sex will gain a reproductive advantage because they will more likely mate with a member of the commoner sex than a member of the commoner sex will mate with a member of the rarer sex. Thus, any time parents start to favor having offspring of one sex over another, natural selection will counteract this, producing the 50-50 ratio again. But as we've seen numerous times throughout this series, nature is rarely simple. Sometimes, producing offspring of one sex is more costly than producing offspring of the other sex. What if a son is metabolically twice as costly to produce as a daughter? A parent could have either one son or, for the same metabolic price, two daughters. In economics, there is the term opportunity cost, which means the loss of potential gain from other alternatives when one alternative is chosen. The opportunity cost of having one son is not having two daughters, and vice versa. Fisher called this zoological usage of the term parental expenditure. So what about when very few males are in possession of most females, a situation called polygyny? Does Fisher's explanation fail here? As it happens, no, and the reasoning is intriguing. 
parents still invest equally in their sons and daughters. The trick is that males are unlikely to mate at all, but when they do, they have extremely many offspring to compensate. Indeed, the zoologist Bernie LeBeouf calculated that for elephant seals, 4% of the males accounted for 88% of the copulations. For males, it's high risk, high reward. By contrast, females are very likely to reproduce, but they reproduce only a few offspring each. Low risk, low reward. Now we understand why male southern elephant seals are so big and have such vicious fights. The males fight because the fate of their genetic lineage depends on it. This tale could equally have been the deer's tail, or the lion's tail, or the baboon's tail, or the stag beetle's tail, because all of these animals have males who compete for control of the females. So, offspring are born to fathers who were large and won fights, as well as mothers who were smaller to optimize metabolic resources for having and rearing offspring. As it happens, males and females have almost entirely the same genes, but only certain genes are turned on in either sex. When the expression of a gene depends on the individual's sex, this is called a sex-limited gene. For example, in male elephant seals, sex-limited genes cause the body to become very large, while in female elephant seals, the sex-limited genes cause the body to stay rather small by comparison. These are the genes responsible for sexual dimorphism, i.e. the morphological differences between males and females. As we might expect, sexual dimorphism for species that maintain large harems of females is much greater than for monogamous species, since males in the former category have to compete more severely for females. This has been extensively verified by comparisons of mean harem size to the ratio of male to female body length. The 1979 paper, Sexual Dimorphisms and Breeding Systems in Pinnipeds, Ungulates, Primates, and Humans, shows that for the former three orders, mean harem size is positively correlated with increased male body length. The more females are up for grabs, the more costly the fight is for males. The stakes and rewards both go up. However, in the opposite direction, the closer a species is to monogamy, the more similar morphologically males are to females. Now what about primates? Remember, gibbons are monogamous and show very little sexual dimorphism, while gorillas are polygamous and are highly sexually dimorphic. So now we come to the really interesting question, are humans sexually dimorphic, and what does that say about our natural breeding system? Humans do indeed possess mild sexual dimorphism. For instance, males are 5-12% to taller on average than females. That doesn't mean there are no females taller than any males, it just means that in a random sample, males tend to be 5-12% to taller than females. As a species, we humans are slightly less sexually dimorphic than chimpanzees, but more dimorphic than gibbons. In hominin evolution on the basis of sexual dimorphism and its predictive power with regard to mating systems, Ardipithecus was pair-bonded, meaning a selective and enduring relationship between two non-kin adults that often coincides with a monogamous mating system and a pair-living social organization. On the other hand, Australopiths were polygamous. If we look at our skeletal stature, we are pair-bonded, like gibbons or calatrachines. So, let's turn from morphology to culture. What do human societies tell us? Surveys of human cultures have indicated that vastly more have practiced polygamy in one form or another than strict monogamy, and the cultures that claim strict monogamy often have polygamy below the surface. Indeed, American anthropologist George Peter Murdoch calculated that at least 70% of all human cultures have practiced or do still practice polygamy in some form. Obviously, there is some difficulty in trying to separate cultures into distinct units, given that cultures can change rapidly over a few generations and be horizontally exchanged with other cultures. Even still, looking at factors like basic economy, settlement patterns, and social and political organization can help generate a rough estimate. But also, polygamy should be qualified. Technically, polygamy solely refers to mating events in which one individual mates with multiple other individuals. Therefore, even if one is faithful in a marriage, having children with only their spouse, and should that marriage be dissolved, with the person going on to have children with someone else in another faithful marriage, then that still technically counts as polygamy. Monogamy means that an individual has offspring with a single other individual. 
In this light, then, it's no wonder that the vast majority of cultures practice some form of polygamy, even if nearly none of them allow for one male to have harems of females. Some researchers prefer to call this model serial monogamy rather than polygamy, even though the effects on sexual dimorphism are the same. The reason very few humans actually live in polygamous units is that it is enormously costly to uphold multiple females and their young. This was likely the case in the past as well, and supports the natural or most common human mating system as being pair bonding. However, again, this is also too simplistic. Humans commonly form pair bonds with heavy investment in young by both sexes, which is super rare. But once the young are raised, it is not uncommon to see divorce in areas where it is allowed, leading to serial monogamy. So humans exhibit the whole range of sexual behaviors from true monogamy to serial monogamy to true polygamy and have mild sexual dimorphism. But obviously, human males don't physically compete for females in the same way elephant seals or gorillas do. So what's going on here? Human males do in fact compete for matings, but they do it differently than you might expect. In species with low sexual dimorphism, male-male competition is achieved through what is known as sperm competition. When a female receives sperm from multiple males, males must compete to ensure that it is their sperm which fertilizes the female. To this end, males have developed a wide variety of adaptations to prevent other males from fertilizing the same female. For example, in male flower beetles, the male reproductive organ, called the adiagus, has chitinous spines that facilitate the removal of a previous male's sperm. We also did a video four years ago, Jesus Christ, on the evolution of the penis bone in mammals, called the baculum, one hypothesized function of which is also sperm removal. Mercifully, humans have neither a baculum nor chitinous penile spines. That's, that's certainly a sentence. Instead, humans have evolved large testes because we too participate in a mating system where multiple males can potentially fertilize the same female. To quote one paper, quote, In gorillas, female promiscuity and sperm competition are rare, and the gorilla's testes are relatively small, making up just 0.03% of their body weight. Chimpanzees, in contrast, are highly promiscuous and, accordingly, males have relatively large testes, making up 0.3% of their body weight. The size of human testes falls between these two extremes at 0.08% of body weight, suggesting intermediate levels of female promiscuity and sperm competition in our evolutionary past. Close quote. Larger testes can produce more sperm, increasing the likelihood of fertilization following insemination. By contrast, gorillas and other mammals that physically battle for females have much smaller testes because one male gains control of a harem with brute strength. As the paper pointed out, they simply don't need to compete with the sperm of other males. Thus, in closing, asking what the natural mating system with regard to humans is, is complicated. If we look at the skeleton, we are pair bonded, but if we look at the testes, we are polygamous. And if we look at human societies, polygamy occurs widely, but isn't practiced by most people. This is a mixed signal, which is not ideal. Together, the data we've looked at supports the notion that the true mating system for Homo sapiens is likely serial monogamy, which is just polygamy over time, mixed with true monogamy. Human mating systems are very complex. Who knew? With all of this in mind, one may wonder, since our ancestors exhibited weak polygamy to true monogamy, does that necessarily mean we have to stick to that too? Or to broaden the question further, should true polygamy, or polyamory, be allowed? Sure, just so long as all the involved parties are consenting adults. Saying we have to do something because it is natural is called the naturalistic fallacy, and anyone trying to tell you otherwise is a propagandist. And that's the seal's tale. Males of polygynous species compete for females, either through physical battling, like elephant seals, or sperm competition, like chimpanzees and us. So, thanks for watching, and we'll see you all next time.